Well, today is certainly both a personal and professional delight to welcome our two speakers, Molly and Lewis Henshaw. <laughs> now, they live in Madison, Wisconsin, yet were willing to make a quick trip to Hawaii on their own to participate in our mini medical school. And I'm very grateful to them for their generosity in doing that. I always love to see them, but I invited them because of their expertise and speaking skills. Now, our first speaker today is Lewis, and I have literally known him since the moment he was born, <laughs> since he is our son. And Lewis was always a curious fellow. One day when we came home from work, Lewis was surrounded by every comb we owned. However, they were all in pieces. So we calmly asked, why? He says, well, you know, on the side of the comb, it says unbreakable. <laughs> he said, I decided to test that. And that statement is incorrect, as you can see. <laughs> that same curiosity has led him to become a highly skilled interventional radiologist at the University of Wisconsin Medical School in Madison, where he specializes in tumor ablation. And that's an exciting approach, which I myself have had done for benign thyroid nodules. And it really works and helped me avoid surgery. So it's a really interesting area. He's also a strong advocate for cancer research, as evidenced by his Coleman big wig, where he's wearing the pink wig in the picture. So please provide a warm welcome for Lewis. All right. We'll make sure the microphone working, everybody can hear me. Yes. Great. So, aloha. aloha. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come here and share some information that I'm very passionate about, which is the treatment of cancer in a minimally invasive way. And Tumor ablation and other ablation uh, or techniques that are being developed now are looking at ways to treat cancer in a way that is easier on the body. We all are aware of surgery and chemotherapy and these other techniques that can be very effective but can also be very debilitating. And so we're working on ways to create treatments where patients can have the treatment and still have a very high quality of life with minimal interruption of their, uh, their life as they go through the treatment. So that's what tumor ablation really is focusing on. So today I'm going to go through different uh, aspects of tumor ablation. I'm going to try to keep it relatively light, but cancer therapy and treatment isn't all that funny. Um, and I'm also going to try to keep you awake, which as they dim the lights might be a little bit of a challenge. I do have a, one disclosure that's pertinent, which is I am a consultant for New Wave Medical, which is an ablation program, uh, ablation system uh, that is out there on the market today. So what we'll do today is we're going to talk a little bit about what is image-guided tumor ablation. Once we've got that established, we're going to talk about when and how we might want to use it in patients. But most of my time, I'm going to focus on patient case examples. Uh, I really don't think it's important that you understand the technical intricacies of how we apply this, but I hope that you come away understanding a better how we might apply it and when it might be appropriate in, in yourself or people you know. So let's start with what is ablation. And ablation itself, uh, if you look it up in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, this is a little bit outdated because it hasn't kept up with current technology, but they say surgical removal or loss of a part of something. Well, this isn't really uh, pertinent to what we do, and so I'm going to give you a, my own definition, which is the focal destruction of tissue using thermal, chemical, or other means. And other means, they, there are other techniques that can use something called irreversible electroporation is one that's in development as we speak. You can use ultrasound power energy to destroy uh, tissue. So there are other ways the most, uh, by, by far the most developed is thermal mechanisms. My mom described having a thyroid nodule ablation. Hers was performed with ethanol or a chemical, but most ablation is done with thermal energy. So it's utilized primarily to destroy unwanted tissues, specifically cancerous tissues, although it can be used for benign processes as well. And so I'll talk to you about both, because I think both are very important. 
And this is, uh, uh, you know, we, we use imaging guidance to do this. You can't do this surgically. You can do this on the su sur surface of your skin. As a matter of fact, many of you have probably had cryoablation on your skin where they put liquid nitrogen on your skin and burn off a, you know, a skin abnormality. That's technically ablation. The difference is when I do it, I'm doing it on the inside of the body and I'm using ultrasound or CT or MRI to guide needle placement into a, a tumor and then I'm applying that energy with a specially designed applicator that allows that tumor to be destroyed in sight without opening the patient up. Okay? Now what happens is once that tissue is destroyed, your body sees that dead tissue and it attacks it and it gets rid of it and it turns into a scar. Just like when you had your cryoablation on your arm and they got rid of that skin disease. So uh, that's what we're doing, except we're doing it on the inside. It's very important that we achieve specific temperatures in order to be effective. 140 degrees Fahrenheit, there's no human tissue that can tolerate that temperature, for example. Same with negative 40. And so we're very specifically trying to achieve those temperatures in the target that we're trying to kill. And this is a fairly typical system that we use, and it has a, a major component. This is the big box, we call it. And that's where the power generation occurs. And then from that, it goes out through a cord into a needle, and that needle is specially designed in order to apply that energy. And there's different techniques. Uh, this one is a microwave ablation system. And so there's a microwave antenna built into the tip of the needle. And once you place that needle into the tumor, it creates energy that heats that tissue up. It's usually kind of ovoid shape, and you have to, as, as you can imagine, when you're applying it, you need to be aware of the shape and size of the ablation zone you're going to create. And all the systems are a little bit different, so you have to be very knowledgeable about your system. So it's always a little bit easier to show something rather than talk about it, although I understand we have a blind member of the audience, so I'll try to describe this, but this is a piece of cow liver, and in that cow liver we have two microwave antennas. And as we heat that tissue, this is an infrared camera showing you the temperature changes within the tissues. And you can see it's heating up to, what is it, it's very high temperatures, this is actually in Celsius, this scale over here, so the red components are in excess of 200 degree, or 180 degrees Fahrenheit. The yellow is about 120, 130, and the yellow, green is about, about 120. And so you're seeing rapid changes in tissue temperatures that result in dead tissue, and this is what it looks like. It looks like a cooked piece of meat, right? And so that's our, essentially what we're doing, is we're cooking that tissue in order to destroy it. And this can be, as you can tell there, can be accomplished fairly quickly. Our treatment times are actually quite short. Most of our time in the process is placing those needles accurately in order to uh, achieve the treatment that we want accurately and safely. So cryo is a little bit different in that you're sucking the heat out of the tissues and you're creating a large ice ball. So you can kind of see that ice ball evolve and grow over time. And that ice ball freezes those tissues and kills them, similar to the liquid nitrogen that you guys, many of you have experienced. And so for the engineers out there, if anybody's curious, it works on the Joule Thompson principle, which is, has to do with expanding gases. And argon gas is the gas that we utilize uh, because it's uh, very uh, advantageous for what we're trying to accomplish. But the point is, specially designed needle applies thermal energy, destroys tissue. That's the basics. So when do we use it? And I, you know, there's a lot of things listed here, but what I want you to focus on is these are the major organs in which we apply it. The liver is a, probably the most common place that we apply it. People with liver cancer from hepatitis, from alcoholism and cirrhosis, a lot of patients uh, uh, come to us looking for therapy. It's actually the standard of care for that uh, particular type of cancer in certain patients. Same thing with the kidney. We treat a lot of kidney cancer. Kidney cancer incidence has increased dramatically over the last 20, 30 years. And uh, a lot of these patients need a, a minimally invasive procedure because they want to preserve their kidney function. Well, our technique is actually very effective there. Uh, lung 
is another place where we're kind of growing. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of lung cancer out there. There's a lot of lung cancer screening programs that are beginning, and they're identifying lung cancer smaller than they used to. And the result is they're looking for other treatment therapies that are less invasive, patients with bad lungs that can't tolerate a surgery and things like that. And so uh, that is growing quickly. Bone, soft tissue, and lymph nodes are another other places we utilize it. And I'll show you examples of all these. So, sounds great, right? We should all have ablation if we ever get cancer. Well, we do have limitations. Our biggest limitation is size. And three to four centimeters, we tend to talk in centimeters in medicine, that's about an inch and a half or so, maybe up to two inches. Uh, that's about as big as we can be 100% effective. And it, nothing's 100% really, right? So the reality is we're about 98% effective, at least in our practice, if we have tumors up to four centimeters in diameter. Unfortunately, a lot of people get diagnosed with cancers that are larger than that, and therefore we may not be uh, the best treatment choice. Um, this is changing quickly over time. Our, our, t our equipment has evolved dramatically in the last 10 years, and we are increasing the size of tumor that we can treat, and, but there's always gonna be a limitation. Location can also be a significant issue. Uh, it has to be in a place where we can destroy that tumor, a margin of the normal tissue, and not worry about the collateral damage uh, causing problems for the patient. And so a good example I'll show you here, this is a schematic of the liver. And you can see the liver is a fairly complex organ with a lot of blood vessels and bile ducts and things coming into the center of it. These tumors that are out at the periphery are easily ablated, easily treated, without worrying about damage to the underlying liver. Um, but when it's central and it's right next to those very important structures, feeding blood supply to the liver, draining the bile out of the liver, then we have to be thoughtful about how we ap approach those tumors, and they may not be eligible for this therapy. So those are our major limitations, size and location. Other than that, we can treat most everything. Um, I will say that a very common scenario that I get asked about is patients who have metastatic disease. So they've got a, a lung cancer and it's gone to the liver or it's gone to the adrenal glands or some other part of their body. Is that treatable? Uh, our role there is pretty limited because all we're doing is we're treating the tumor that we're seeing and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the margin of normal tissue. When you have metastatic disease, that means it's in numerous locations, most likely. And there's just a limit to how much we can actually accomplish. And so those patients are generally better uh, treated with systemic therapies like chemotherapy and things like that. Things that will treat the whole disease process rather than just one tumor. And so uh, we generally are, uh, uh, play a limited role there. Every now and then we do, especially for what we call palliative care, where we're trying to treat symptoms or things to make life better but understanding that we're probably not curing the patient. So it's been a lot of research going on um, over the last 15 years uh, since I started doing this. And uh, we've been responsible actually for a fair percentage of it. I'm pretty proud of our group there at Wisconsin. We've done a lot of work in this area. We've created a, a, a system that is out there and internationally being used in Europe and Southeast Asia and the US uh, and doing very well. And, uh, it's changed the way we, that we work and what we can accomplish, and that's pretty exciting because it really does open up this opportunity for other patients that before wouldn't be eligible. Larger, hotter ablations, much quicker. Most of our treatments are around five minutes. So that's pretty quick, um, and, uh, and it's pretty exciting to be able to provide that. It's safe. It's been shown on, on numerous studies. Only about 2% of our patients have any kind of significant complication. Most of those complications are self-limited and go away on their own. We do have a bit of a PR issue, if you will, in that a lot of people don't know about us. How many people in this room have heard about tumor ablation before they looked it up or read about it for this course? Yeah, not very many. That's not too good, because it's a great treatment, and we should have a lot more of it going on. Um, so hopefully, people, you know, coming to places like this and giving these talks and, you know, uh, educating people about this will increase how much this is utilized because I do think it's an important thing to have available. So now I'm just going to show you some case examples, and I'm going to focus more on the patient and the patient's story than the technicalities of how we accomplished it because I think that's hopefully a little bit more interesting to you guys.
So this is a 34-year-old woman, and in her liver, you'll see this round white area. That's the tumor. This is called an hepatic adenoma. Hepatic adenomas are not cancerous, but they can bleed and they can become cancerous over time if you leave them in place. And so if you're a woman with, most women, they're mostly women who get these, if you're a woman with an hepatic adenoma, over four centimeters in diameter, you'll be, it'll be suggested to you that you should have a surgical resection of that tumor. Well, this is actually something I'm really passionate about, which is these are almost all young people. And a, hepatic, a liver resection is a big surgery with significant potential complications. And what I do is so straightforward and simple and easy and safe that it really should be the standard of care. And I'm working on changing that uh, through the work that we do. So here's what we do. We, uh, here's are her options. She could have surgical resection. Like I say, that's often considered the standard of care. There's a technique called embolization, and embolization will decrease your risk of bleeding, but it doesn't get rid of the tumor totally. And so I'm going to say surgical resection and embolization aren't the best choices here. I'm going to say this patient should have image-guided tumor ablation, and I hope that this becomes a standard of care over time. So here we are doing the procedure, and you see these three white dots in the liver in the area of that tumor. Those are our three microwave antennas that have been placed into that tumor. And this is after we've destroyed the tissue. And what you'll see is there's some gas in there. That's the black stuff. That's from the boiling tissue. So we heat it, heat it up so hot that it boils, actually. And a lot of the water boils off, and, um, and it shrinks down. And you'll see that it's no longer white. It's kind of dark. And I'll show you the follow-up. This is what it looks like a year later. And here you can see this bright light bulb. And here it's a black hole. That's because we've killed that tissue and we've decre you know, got rid of all the vascular perfusion that's going to it uh, that results in it lighting up on these scans. And so this is a young woman that now has little needle punctures and a Band-Aid rather than a huge liver resection with a massive scar. So, I don't know what you would choose, but I'm pretty sure what I would choose. <laughs> so, we've published this. This is our experience. This is uh, looking at uh, uh, patients who've had this uh, disease and had good results. And, and as the literature expands, I, I hope more and more people have this. Another patient. This is a 45-year-old guy. He was actually a pretty hard-working construction guy. And he had constant back pain that they really couldn't figure out for a while. And then they did a scan and they realize he has what's called a liver hemangioma. It's just a benign tumor in the liver. A lot of us have them. Most of the time, it doesn't cause any problems. But his was big enough that it was pressing on his liver capsule. And this is it right here, this black, this darker area. And it was pressing on its liver capsule. And actually, it was causing atrophy or you know, kind of uh, destruction of part of his liver. And it was causing pain and, and symptoms. And so you could go to surgery and, once again, have this cut out. But the reality is, is that's a pretty invasive procedure, especially in the location where this is in the back of the liver. And so they asked me to do ablation. And once again, this is a great indication for that because we're able to destroy, even though it's a big tumor, we're able to destroy a large majority of it and hopefully get rid of the, uh, the uh, symptoms. And so this is just the intra-procedural images, and you can see the gas from the boiling tissues, this black stuff. And then on ultrasound, it actually shows up as bright. As bright. Most people tell me ultrasound looks like snowstorms, so I, I won't bother you with trying to look at that. Um, and then same thing, over, you know, the black from the gas. So we had to do two different placements, do multiple ablations. It took about an hour and a half or so, all told, between all the placements and burning and everything. And here it is afterwards, and you see this bright stuff around the periphery of the tumor? That's actually a little residual blood flow. So I haven't killed the entire tumor, and I knew that going, up front, going in. If this was a cancer, I wouldn't have tried to treat it, because there's no way I'm going to realistically get every cell and kill everything and cure this man of a cancer that that big with the technique that we use. But that's not my goal here. My goal here is to get rid of his symptoms. And for that, it was very effective. And there's a couple reasons why. Number one, 
It uh, destroys the tissue so that it's not pushing on things. It's not perfused. It's not pulsating. You know, it pulsates with every blood uh, uh, heartbeat. And number two, the volume contraction associated with what we do is significant. So the volume of the tumor is actually half of what it was uh, afterwards as it was before. So it was pushing on things and causing problems, and it's no longer doing that. And so this patient's now three years out and doing really well, no pain, no issues. Um, and very happy because he had a relatively minimally invasive procedure that gave him the result that he wanted, which is to get rid of his pain. So can be very effective. What about liver cancer? So this is our most common indication, which is primary liver can cancer called hepatocellular carcinoma uh, caused by uh, hepatitis, alcoholism, other things that cause cirrhosis. And this is a relatively small tumor. You can see this little black uh, area here. It's a little over a centimeter. I'm not sure why that changed, but uh, a little over a centimeter. It's a small tumor. Um, but if, you, if you're going to do surgery for this, you'd actually have to take out a pretty big part of the liver because it's relatively central in the liver. Sometimes they can kind of what they call wedge them out, where they just take a chunk like that. But because this is relatively central, you'd probably have to take almost half the liver to get rid of this. Well, most of these patients have a diseased liver at baseline, cirrhosis. And so if you took out half of their liver, you might potentially put them into liver failure and cause significant problems. Not only that, because of their liver failure, they're at much higher risk of complications associated with a liver resection than the other patients. And that's why this has really become the standard of care here. It's a relatively small tumor. I can see it here on the CT scan. You see that little ovoid dark area. And I can put an antenna in it and take care of it. Now, we have some technology, and I'll just show you briefly. This is called ablation confirmation. In ablation confirmation, I draw, I draw out the tumor on the pre-procedural imaging, and then I put my needle in place. We use ultrasound guidance to do that. It's a little bit tough to, for you guys to tell exactly what's going on there. But then I can confirm this little bright area in the middle of that red tumor. That's the needle. So now I've confirmed I'm in the right place. Once I've confirmed in the right place, I do the ablation. This big white cloud is our ablation zone. And then I take the uh, ablation zone and I compare it on the post uh, imaging to the uh, tumor on the pre-imaging, and I can confirm that I've completely encompassed that entire tumor and the area around it. And this has been a big advance for us because otherwise you're kind of guessing a little bit. You're kind of looking at the pre and the post, and you're saying, oh, I don't know, did I get it all? And after a while, if you've done a lot of them, you can kind of figure it out pretty effectively. But if you're relatively new to it, it's really challenging sometimes. So you can potentially see that little red dot in there. That's actually the tumor that's been totally destroyed. And that's, like I say, our most common indication. We do a lot of those. And uh, unfortunately, it's uh, growing in uh, numbers as hepatitis becomes uh, more common. Now, that being said, we have some effective treatments for hepatitis, so hopefully this will go away to some degree, but, um, but not completely. This is an interesting uh, patient. This is a 60-year-old guy. He came in, and he had uh, lung cancer. And uh, he came into the hospital because his blood sugars kept going too high, and uh, I mean, I'm sorry, too low, and they were trying to figure out why his blood sugars are too low. Does it have something to do with his lung cancer? Well, it turns out it doesn't. It turns out that he has what's called an insulinoma, which is a pancreas cancer that creates insulin. And most of us know if you put in insulin into your body, your blood sugars go down. And so this tumor is creating insulin constantly and an unregulated fashion. So this guy's blood sugar kept going down, down, down. And as a matter of fact, they couldn't get him out of the hospital because he needed constant sugar infusions in order to keep from becoming so profoundly low in blood sugar that he would uh, die. And so he was stuck in the hospital with lung cancer that gave him a prognosis of about 6 to 12 months. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't want to spend the last 6 to 12 months of my life in the hospital with lung cancer and not able to get away from an IV infusion of sugar. So... Normally, this patient might go to surgery, um, but he's 410 pounds at this point, and he is a very poor surgical candidate for a lot of reasons. And so they asked me if I would consider ablation. Now, this is very outside of the box, by the way. This is not something we would typically do because the pancreas doesn't usually respond very well. 
So this image shows you the pancreas. This is the pancreas here. And there's, you can see this bump on the pancreas, and that's the tumor itself. That's the insulinoma. And so I decided I would give this a try. And the reason is because most of it's outside of the pancreas. So you can see I can destroy most of it without affecting the pancreas. And number two, I'm not trying to get every cell. I'm just trying to knock it down enough that his insulin production goes down and he can get out of the hospital. And so these are the interprocedural images. You can kind of see this needle coming down toward his pancreas here. And I put it into the pancreas uh, using what we call CT fluoroscopy. There's the tumor. There's the needle. Looks pretty good. This is another view where you can see it's uh, relatively well-centered, but a little bit out away from the pancreas itself. And that was kind of purposeful. I didn't want to uh, kill the pancreas if I could help it. So I'm doing the ablation, and you can see the gas, the dark stuff, kind of replace that tumor as I do the ablation. So that looks pretty good. And here's pre, before, here's after. You see this little white line here? That's a little bit of a residual enhancement of the tumor. The rest of the tumor is dark, which means that I've killed it. And uh, in fact, this worked incredibly effectively. Um, this was beforehand. This is him getting all this infusion of sugar. And then right after the procedure, his sugars spiked really high because we were still infusing the sugar and, uh, and the insulin production had disappeared. Then we stopped the sugar and he was discharged to home about, I think it was about 24 hours after the procedure. So once again, it's not a, necessarily something that's going to cure this guy of that cancer, but it certainly got rid of his symptoms, allowed him to go home. He passed away about six months later, seven months later uh, after this procedure, but he was home and he never had to be rehospitalized. Uh, so that was a, a success, although uh, not a perfect one. Kidney cancer is a common indication. We've actually, I've actually had one of the people who live here on the islands uh, come to Wisconsin to have their kidney cancer treated at Wisconsin. Um, this is not that case, but I'll show you a case. Uh, this is a patient, 67-year-old male. He's pretty healthy, actually, um, but he has a 2.2-centimeter kidney cancer on his left side. That's about an inch in diameter. And so, um, you know, you could have surgery for this, that's a pretty big invasive procedure. This guy was pretty active. He didn't want something that's going to knock him back, uh, potentially cause problems. And so he came to us for ablation. So here's the left kidney. And in the left kidney, you'll see this round, kind of darker area. And that is the kidney cancer. And so what do we do? Well, we use ultrasound. You can see it. It's just actually it's bright on ultrasound. It's always a little bit counterintuitive, but things are often the opposite color on ultrasound as compared with CT. Um, but it's bright on ultrasound. We use that ultrasound to place the needles into it. And trust me, I can tell that those needles are where they're supposed to be. And then we burn it, and it turns white and disappears. And that's what we're hoping for. And so this is afterwards. So this is before. Here's afterwards, and you can see it's become dark on CT, really dark, and that's because it's not perfusing. And then over time, it kind of disappears and kind of turns into a scar. And so this is the second most common indication for what we're doing these days. And uh, in very effective therapy, um, our, biggest, our series is one of the biggest, and we have over 100 patients now that have had this. And, um, and of all those patients, we've only had to retreat patients twice and we've had no patients that have progressed, so uh, working very well. Now, this is a problem, though, sometimes for us, which is that in this case, you can see on this image, there's the tumor at the bottom of the kidney, and this actually right here, this is small bowel. And if I were to injure the small bowel while doing this procedure, that would be catastrophic because you, you would have a rupture of the bowel into the abdomen, and that, that's, you can't tolerate that. That's not, that's not good. And so... What do we do here? Well, early on, we kind of struggled with this, and we often did these in the operating room. They would, we'd have the surgeon move the bowel away or something like that and then do the procedure. But that's more invasive than it really needs to be. And so what we developed is something called hydrodissection, so water dissection. And essentially, all we do is place a needle between the tumor and the small bowel, and then we inject fluid. In this case, I've got some contrast in there so I can see it, and create space between that small bowel and that tumor. And creating that space allows me to very safely then put the antenna 
into the tumor and pour, perform this procedure without con being concerned about it injuring that bowel. And this has changed the way we do things for sure. About 30 to 40 percent of our patients have this hydrodissection performed during ablation. They're patients that otherwise wouldn't be eligible, but now we've made them eligible. So it's a, it's a wonderful advance. Um, lung cancer, like I told you, we're definitely uh, increasing our involvement in lung cancer. This is a 67-year-old woman. She actually had pretty bad emphysema, and they didn't think she would tolerate a, uh, a surgical resection. Um, it's getting more and more common. So surgery is out. So you can see surgery is our first option for most of these patients. If you go to your physician, if you had lung cancer, they would tell you surgery is the, your first option. Hopefully you can, you're eligible for surgery. Um, and if you aren't, then the next thing they'll talk to you about is radiation. And radiation is a non-invasive uh, procedure where they kind of bombard you with radioactive particles and kill the tissue. Now, you can imagine, even though it's called non-invasive, it's actually not, right? Because you're killing that tumor. You know you're killing tissue around it as well, right? It's not benign. A lot of people get very tired with radiation. There are certain complications that occur. Um, you can get broken uh, bones then the bone that they destroy. You can get uh, destruction of the underlying lung parenchyma. There's all kinds of issues associated with it. That being said, it's not necessarily a bad option. It's just it does have certain uh, downsides. And then the last one is ablation. And um, a lot of times if they're small or in a good location, we'll definitely consider those. So that's what we chose in this case. You can see this small round nodule in the lung. This is cancer. This patient actually already had radiation on this side. So this is what we call radiation pneumonitis, which is where you kind of um, destroy the lung parenchyma. And it turns into a, a looks kind of like a mass, but in fact, it's it's just this fibrotic tissue. That's one of the reasons they didn't do radiation in this patient, because once you have it once, it's really hard to do it again. And so uh, here we are. We put a needle into the tumor, and we ablate it. Doesn't look much different, does it? And that's one of the challenges with lung ablation, is that when we ablate it, it's a little bit more challenging with, than it is with liver and kidney and other organs to tell that we completely killed the tumor. So how do we know we did? Well. A lot of ways, but this is before, this is after, and this is six months later. And you can see it kind of turns into a scar. It shrinks down. So that's the main thing we're looking at on those follow-up images to make sure that it does what we think it's going to. And if it does, we can consider this cured. Um, we do have ways of kind of looking at these images and trying to assess whether or not there's any residual cancer or not. Um, but I don't want to get into the details of that now. But the point is, really well-tolerated um, any uh, complication that we have happens right away, and we can generally treat it and then send the patient home within a couple days. So um, very well tolerated, uh, an excellent choice for a lot of these patients. Another story, uh, this is a, an older woman, she's 73, she has endometrial cancer. And this endometrial cancer has invaded her pelvis. This is the, down in her pelvis, this is one of her bones called the ischium and it's been replaced and destroyed by this cancer. She actually couldn't walk. She was in so much pain that she couldn't walk. She was bedridden, and she uh, was in terrible shape. This is my one case of cryoablation I'm going to show you, and uh, we use it a lot in the musculoskeletal system. And what you'll see, there's these needles in here, and then the dark area is the ice ball. So that ice ball I showed you in the water at the beginning, that's, this is what we see on imaging when we create that ice ball in human tissues. And so we've destroyed this. And uh, although she died of metastatic disease four months later, she was pain-free uh, from her pelvic disease over that time and incredibly grateful to be able to walk and to uh, not have that pain. So once again, sometimes we treat patients even though we know we're not going to cure them if we think that we can treat their symptoms. All right, so my last story, and this one's pretty personal, and has to do with my mom uh, and one of her great friends. So this is Robin Dothit. She's the retired dean of human ecology at the University of Wisconsin. And by the way, I do have her permission to tell this story. And there's my mom, and this is many years ago. This is when uh, at one of the Race for the Cures and a couple other really good friends here. And Robin's been... Uh, struggling with breast cancer for a long time. 
She was uh, first diagnosed a long time ago in 1998 when she was 43 years old. By the fact that I'm telling you this story, that tells you she's quite a success story because she's still alive today. She did at that time have radiation and chemotherapy. They hoped that they were done with it. But then in 2000, two years later, she got metastatic disease to the liver. At that time, ablation was kind of in its infancy, and we certainly uh, wouldn't have been considered in this scenario. And they did surgery, and they resected part of her liver. She did well, actually, for nine years, as you can say, and then she developed metastatic disease to her spine and ribs. She had a combination of radiation and chemotherapy. But then in 2012, she developed new metastatic disease in the liver. Now, one of the downsides of doing a liver resection for metastatic disease, like she had, is that once you've done it once, it's kind of hard to repeat. You can only cut out so much of the liver, and you'll get in trouble. And so she didn't really have an option. Not only that, ablation had developed quite a bit since by 2012, and she knew my mom, and she knew what I did. And so even though her oncologist didn't initially recommend us, she sought us out. As a, uh, as a possible alternative. So this is the, see this round uh, mass in her liver? This is her metastatic disease in her liver. You can see it's about three and a half centimeters, which is about an inch and a half in diameter. And it's right next to the one of the major blood vessels. This is the IVC, or the inferior vena cava, that drains all the blood from your legs and everything up into your heart. So it's right next to it, so we do have to be a little bit careful on that. Um, but I said, yeah, let's give this a try. I think we can treat this, I think we can get rid of it, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we can be done with it by then. So our options, like I say, previous surgery kind of obviates another surgery. Chemo, you know, um, chemo's great. Chemo doesn't tend to cure a disease like this, where it's metastatic breast cancer. They tend to knock it back, keep it at bay, but it doesn't tend to cure it over the long term. And that's why we choose tumor ablation. Radiation would also be theoretically possible here. So here's before and here's after. I've done the ablation. I've destroyed the tumor. You can see the gas in there. You can see all this dark tissue that's been destroyed. This is the margin of normal tissue. And I'm glad to say that this is her four days later visiting my mom here in Hawaii. So the recovery is pretty quick, uh, which is nice. And uh, you can tell she feels pretty good right there. So uh, this, that was in 2012. Here's 2016. It looks great. Uh, it's kind of, you know, come down into a tiny scar. And uh, we were pretty happy at that point. Um, unfortunately, her story is ongoing and may be for some time yet, which is that she developed another side of disease. This is another tumor in her liver. And this was in 2017, January of 2017. I did another ablation on her. And this is her in September of 2017. And you can see this is a PET scan. So if anything's bad, it shows up bright. Uh, these are the kidneys, so they show up bright anyhow. But you can see there's not, these are dark holes, which is what you want to see. So we've got her to no disease again. And hopefully she'll stay that way. I cross my fingers. But you never know. And that's one of the great things about ablation is it can be repeated. If you do get other sites of disease, you can uh, do this procedure again. So Robin really is a modern, a miracle of modern medicine. She's had everything you can have, surgery, chemo, radiation, and ablation. And they've all played important roles in her care. And that is the future of medicine. Applying the right treatment in the right patient at the right time. And um, it takes a lot of coordination between different specialties. It takes a lot of knowledge and understanding of, of cancer uh, to do that, that uh, effectively. And, it cre and so we have a lot of multidisciplinary tumor boards where we talk about this and create these uh, treatment pathways for patients um, that are very specific to their cancer subtype, their cancer uh, story. And that is hopefully the future of medicine. So she's 19 years out and doing great and so happy for Robin and uh, she's a good friend to all of us. So in summary, Tumor ablation is really in sync with the changes occurring in medicine. It's less invasive, it's safer, and it's equally effective if applied in appropriate patients by experienced operators. And I'm going to really kind of say this, has a, this is a definitely a subspecialized skill. You don't want just anybody doing this out in the community. You want pay, people that do a lot of these because there are things that you have to be aware of and be uh, good at. 
Um, it can be life-changing and life-saving, but we do have a PR problem. Please spread the word. Tell people about what we do. And, uh, and if you ever have any questions, my mom will know how to get in touch with me. So uh, just let me know. I'm always happy to answer any questions you may have and uh, help people uh, get better treatment. Uh, thank you very much.